So we all know about the history of Peyronie's disease. This is the, the, the uh, classic picture of, of Peyroni, who actually wasn't the first to, to, to describe plastic induration of the penis, but indeed Fallopius uh, was the first to describe it in a single patient in 1561. But then Peroni came along and, and came up with a series of, of patients as, as, as a result of his being tasked by the King of France to begin a royal college of, of surgeons in France, and one of, the, one of the things that he was tasked with was coming up with a journal for, for the Royal College of Surgeons. So, and so in the second volume of the, of the journal of the Royal College of, of Surgeons of France, he described five patients with, with uh, penile curvature caused by what he thought was irritation. It's not too far from what we believe today, but indeed uh, he felt that the, the best way to treat it was bathing in the waters of Barege in southern France. And truly, until recently, we didn't have anything really better than bathing in the waters of Barege. Um, Peroni was indeed from the south of France, and whether he owned the waters of Barege or not, I guess, is a, a matter of historical contro controversy, but, but clearly there wasn't much progress until, until recently. So we've all know, always known that Peroni's disease, along with Dupuytren's contracture, ran in families, and indeed, uh, those of us who see a lot of Peroni's patients, if you, if you ask the patients carefully enough, they often will say that they had a family member that had Peroni's disease, but more often will say they had a family member that had Dupuytren's contracture because, you know, m most, uh, most fathers don't discuss with their sons the nature of their penis, so we don't, really don't know the, 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 the family history as well as we probably should. But the group at Baylor has looked at, at, uh, at a, a genomic uh, hybridization array and looked at, at a group of men with both Peroni's disease and Dupuytren's contracture and a family history of either one of those two things and looked at, at ge the genetic predisposition and found very interestingly that there was a, uh, that there was a, a mutation affecting the NEL1 uh, function in 12 of the 14 men that they looked at. They're continuing to expand that, that group of patients to see if, if, if that holds up in a larger subset of population but in the normal population, it's very, it's that, that, particular, that particular mutation is very, very rare. So it may have something to do with, uh, with, uh, the, with a gene on chromosome one and a, and a mutation of that gene that produces the, the, the family history or the family likelihood of Peyronie's disease. But again, uh, stay tuned because it may be that that's, that that's a red herring, but it appears to be uh, a lead for what we, what we now believe is a, is a genetic predisposition for Peyronie's disease. Well, Peyronie's disease has a great emotional impact. There have been a number of studies that have looked at that, showing significant uh, depression, both, both, uh, both mild as well as severe depression in men with Peyronie's disease. They're significantly, uh, they're significantly concerned about not only the curvature of the penis, but the loss of length. And we who see Peyronie's disease know that our patients with Peyronie's disease often lose a third to a half of their penile length, which is a significant problem, in addition to the curvature or hourglass deformity that many of those patients have. So emotional problems in 82% of the patients with Peyronie's disease with an odds ratio of 8.0, which is huge, and penile length was, was, was probably the biggest independent predictor of, of emotional problems with, with these patients. So the patients that you see with Peyronie's disease are not only coming to you because they have curve of the penis, but they're emotionally devastated often by this, by this particular problem. Another, another uh, issue with Peyronie's disease that's recently been reported widely is the association of, of hypogonadism in Peyronie's disease. We actually uh, did one of the studies ourselves. The third bullet point is from, from, from our own institution. But uh, Abe Morgenthaler found that 74% of his Peroni's patients had testosterone, total testosterones of less than 300 in 121 Peroni's patients. Now you have to realize that there's a bit of a, of a, of a selection bias because Abe Morgenthaler's practice is predominantly low testosterone patients. The group at Baylor found that, that uh, there, were, there were men with lower t total testosterone with Peroni's disease with or without Peroni's disease. In our own uh, study that we, we published uh, a few years ago, we looked at an age 
controlled group of patients with erectile dysfunction without Peyronie's disease and a group of patients with Peyronie's disease and found low testosterone in the same number of patients, but that's still more than the normal population. So I think it's reasonable in those patients, especially if they're depressed and they have erectile dysfunction associated with their Peyronie's disease, to screen them for hypogonadism uh, at the time that you at the time that you see to see them for their Peyronie's disease. Well, this is a typical Peyronie's patient. We are, we've all seen this kind of a man that has dorsal curvature most often and some hourglass deformity. A patient that's that's significantly bothered by his by his Peyronie's disease. Oral therapy oral therapy has has really been tried on a number of, with a number of agents. This is a busy slide, but suffice it to say that it really doesn't work. There have been very few placebo-controlled or well-designed trials looking at that oral therapy and everything from Pataba to vitamin E to colchicine, L-carnitine, pentoxyphylline, all of those um, have had very few trials, although pentoxyphylline did have one trial that showed, uh, that showed some significant improvement over placebo. And pentoxyphylline is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, a non-selective phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Probably the best studies are those with, with uh, the PD-5 inhibitors that have been looked at both in the laboratory out at UCLA as well as in, 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 in some clinical trials looking at, looking at whether those, uh, those PD-5 inhibitors Im improve Peyronie's disease, especially in the early stages of Peyronie's disease. And indeed, a number of studies have shown, and this study that was reported at the AUA in 2019 showed an improvement in pain, that's not a great marker, but also an improvement in curvature as well as plaque size in early Peyronie's disease treated with daily Tadalafil. So clearly that's a reasonable thing in those patients that may have erectile dysfunction anyway, but the PD-5 inhibitors may be helpful in, in, uh, in improving the Peyronie's disease itself. And indeed, in, the, in, in uh, animal studies, all of the PD-5 inhibitors have shown a regression of scar tissue in an animal model of Peyronie's disease uh, in, in, in the laboratory. So probably the only oral agents that have stood the test of laboratory <coughs> investigation and double-blind placebo-controlled trials are the PD-5 inhibitors, and I think that's a reasonable thing, especially now that Tadalafil is off patent and you can get the, get the, the, the uh, pills for uh, 50 cents to a dollar a pill, so it's clearly something that, that we can use for our, especially early Peyronie's patients. What about injection therapy? Well, there are a number of, of, of agents that have been used for injection therapy. Uh, steroids were used back in the 1970s with, with very poor, uh, per, poor results. Orgotine was used in, in Europe, uh, not in the United States. But then verapamil and interferon were used in the US with small trials. Uh, interferon probably had the best trial, a multicenter trial that was placebo controlled by, by Wayne Hellstrom that showed uh, an advantage of, of, uh, of, of interferon over placebo. But that's been uh, supplanted now by collagenase, uh, so-called Zyaflex, which uh, is, is, is uh, single-use vials uh, of sterilized powder. It's reconstructed and then injected into the patient, as you're all aware. And it initially was used very successfully with Dupuytren's contracture and continues to be so. We actually had a, 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 a fellow at, at, at UNC that was, a, that was in the Navy, and he was, a, he, was, he was a robotic fellow, and he had very bad Dupuytren's contracture. I didn't ever ask him if he had Peyronie's disease, but he had, uh, he had, a, he had a very bad Dupuytren's and couldn't work, the, couldn't manipulate the, 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 uh, the robot. So he went to the, the hand surgeon, had, the, had his Dupuytren's uh, fixed with, with, uh, with uh, Zyaflex, and was back operating within 10 days. So that's huge. It's very different than having a reconstructive uh, hand surgical procedure to try to release the, the Dupuytren's contracture. So how do we treat patients with, with uh, collagenase with uh, Peyronie's disease? Well, you're all aware of, the, of, the, of, of how this is done with uh, a, an injection first in the office, uh, then one to three days later a second injection, then in office modeling for the patients and then finally uh, have the patients model on a daily basis for six weeks and then repeat this up to four times. I, I won't go into that in detail because you're all quite aware of, of, of how that works. There were two studies that were required to approve uh, clostridium injection in the U.S. The FDA requires two studies. The two studies were exactly the same, just a large study divided in half. 
And uh, they demonstrated very, very clearly that there was an improvement in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the Peyronie's disease. And this is the, these are the baseline data showing the patients were in their 50s. They had a mean, mean curvature of about 50 degrees. They had a PDQ or prostate disease questionnaire score of about uh, uh, seven and a half to eight and a half. Placebo and, 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 and drug were about the same in both groups. About a quarter of them had history of penile trauma and the mean duration of Peyronie's disease was around three and a half to four years. So that was kind of the, kind of the, the, the bottom line to it. But their, their, their PDQ bother scores uh, did not directly correlate with, with, uh, with the amount of curvature, which was interesting to us when we looked at the data in the study. So a patient could have 60 degrees and minimal bother, could have 30 degrees and terrible bother. And I think we, we probably know that from our clinical practice that many patients are bothered by 15 or 20 degrees and some patients come in with 60 degrees and are, and, and are doing relatively well. So how did the studies turn out? Basically, these are the, the, the clinical results of the studies. There was an improvement of about 35% in, 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 in study number one and 33.2% in study number two, clinically significantly better than, than uh, placebo. All of these patients had modeling. The original studies that was, was interesting was, was four, four arms where they had modeling with and without drug, modeling with and without placebo. And interestingly, the patients that had drug without modeling did exactly the same as patients that had placebo and modeling. So modeling is hugely important in this, in this, in this endeavor to get patients to have a straight penis. And, in, and indeed, I, when I talk to my patients, I basically tell them, this is a team sport. I can't, I'll do my part, but you've got to do your part to get the result that we, that we need to get. So the modeling is criti critically important. Here's the results that you can expect. This is uh, actually an Australian patient. Their North Carolina patients are much bigger than that, but um, that's, this is the kind of thing you, that you can expect in, in the majority of, of the patients that you treat. So this, is, this uh, again, looks at the two studies and shows, shows that, oh, this is study one, actually, and basically shows that, there, that, that the improvement is durable uh, during the follow-up period. There's no regression back to the, the uh, ri original curvature. Equally important, though, is the is the is the results of the of the bothersomeness. This is this is the um, the PDQ score, and you can see the PDQ score was improved in both studies one and studies two uh, in 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 a statistically significant improvement. And you ask why why is placebo better? Why why would the patients with placebo get better? They're modeling. The patients with placebo are modeling. So that the, the modeling is critically is critically important to the outcome for the patients of, 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 these, of, these, of these trials, of these drugs. These are the adverse events, and I'm going through this a little quickly because basically this is not new to, I'm sure, anybody in this audience, but the adverse events are significantly different between the placebo and the Zyaflex group, and why is that? I mean, when, when we were doing the placebo-controlled trial, I knew who was on, who, who'd gotten the, the dr drug versus who'd gotten placebo. The guys with the drug came in, and they were bruised, and they looked like uh, an eggplant. And the guys with placebo, their penis looked absolutely normal. So it was, it was blinded, supposedly, but uh, in, in, in practice, we kind of knew. So the, the, major, the major side effects are basically uh, hematoma, penile swelling, and penile pain. And those are the things that are, were, were much more likely to occur in the, in the, in the treatment group than the, uh, than the placebo group. Well, one of the new things that's been proposed, and this was proposed by the group at UCLA, was to do a, to do a, 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 a fan technique of, of, of um, injection. I think that's a very nice idea, but the amount of drug that you use is a quarter of a milliliter. And so if you can actually get that quarter of a milliliter into the plaque, that's what you need to do. This fan technique is probably not going to be effective because the volume is too low to, to make that happen. So what else can we do? Well, basically, uh, the, the group in, in, in the UK, uh, David Ralph and his group, came up with a modified technique for injection using fewer injections than, than, uh, than the, the, the classic uh, uh, package insert of, of, and, and from the trials. Interestingly, uh, the, the, the people in the UK are, are fairly livid because they've, they've stopped uh, importing 
the, this drug, CCH, to, to, to the UK, and they can't get the drug anymore for their patients. So that's, it's, a, it's a significant problem for them. But, in, but the modified is basically using a, uh, a, a, much, uh, a much shorter course of, of, of medication. So this is basically, let me see if I can get the thing to work here, um, injecting the patient, doing penile stretching, maybe a vacuum pump, and no investigator modeling, and then, uh, and then having them come back in 24 to 72 hours for a second injection, but uh, only, only, having, uh, only doing uh, essentially three injections altogether. And here's, here's the, the results of their, their, their modified technique. So this actually takes only three injections versus the, the, uh, the eight injections that are in the, in the standard technique. And here's the, the PDQ improvement. You can see significant improvement. And the, the numbers are exactly the same as with the, as with the trial itse itself using eight injections. Here's the, here's the, um, the, re the results of the penile curvature, again, showing improvement, best improvement in patients in the middle ground of, of, of angulation, but numbers that are very similar to the eight injections. So the modified injections for patients, especially if they don't have insurance coverage for this drug, which is very expensive, may be a, equally as effective, but, uh, but uh, a lot less expensive than the, than the, uh, than the, than the standard technique. Here's the modified uh, technique in, the, in, in uh, looking at baseline versus three injections, medium mean curvature reduction, and you can see that it's, it's, it's about uh, 30 to 40 percent, which is the same thing as the, as the trial using eight injections. So I think we can probably modify in some of our patients the number of injections that they get, which is much more convenient, obviously. You don't lose efficacy. But it may be, especially in the patients that are not insur insurance covered for this drug, uh, may be a reasonable alternative. So what about penile extenders? What about stretching devices? This is the older stretching device, the fast size penile extender. Uh, it was never really tried with, uh, in, in, a, in a large trial with, uh, with, with Zyaflex. Uh, but the newer, a newer one that was designed at the Mayo Clinic has been tried with Zyaflex and shown some, some improvement. And this newer one, is, is interesting because not only does it, will it put the, put the penis on stretch, as you see here, but it also will do, it will also do uh, the angulation or the modeling. Doesn't that look like, doesn't that look great? It also will do the modeling for, for patients that, that, um, that, that, have, that have penile curvature. I see a lot of, a lot of people sweating in the audience, but uh, <laughs> mostly the males. But it does work, and this is this is the the, the trial that they that, that was published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine uh, uh, last year, looking at at, um, at 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 the utilization of the of this of this trial. But then the curvature improvement here you can see drug drug with some other stretching modality. So you can see that there's no difference with that. But if you add this restore uh, restore X, which is used. For about uh, uh, five to ten minutes, two to three times daily, in an effort to to do modeling with uh, with with stretching, you can see that there's a significant improvement in, in degrees of restoration of of of, uh, of straight uh, straight penis in these in this group of, in this group of patients. There was also interestingly an, an improvement in penile length. Again, that was the thing when we talked about uh, when we talked about depression and, and emotional problems with Peyronie's disease. Penile length was one of the big things that patients were most concerned about, but you can see that they actually did get some improvement in length when they used a combination of, of, the, of the drug and uh, the Restore X, uh, Restore X device. I have no, no interest in this device, so uh, don't, uh, don't, don't, uh, uh, don't take it as though I have, I'm, I'm making any money from it, because I don't. These are some of the post-injection uh, post, uh, problems that we see, so most of these are self-limiting. Penile fracture is certainly a significant problem, and uh, we see that we see uh, 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 fractures occasionally. I've seen one in my practice. I think everybody else sees a, an occasional fracture in the, in the trial itself. The fracture, uh, the fracture um, incidence was 0.05 percent, so it was basically five patients out of a thousand that had penile fractures. Of the five patients, three of them were treated surgically, two were treated expectantly, 
and, and resolved without, without a surgical procedure, but clearly it's important to tell your patients that that's a possibility. So let me move on from that. So you can, if, if you're worried about a fracture, uh, MRI is, is a good way to make the diagnosis. This is uh, from, from, uh, from uh, Journal of Sexual Medicine in 2019, but you can see, you can identify the fracture with, uh, with, an, with an MRI if you can get one in the, in, in, in the, on the weekend or the middle of the night when this usually occurs. So I'm going to go through a little bit of, of shockwave uh, lithotripsy, shockwave therapy for, for, uh, for Peyronie's disease. There are a number of studies that's still controversial. We tried to get the FDA in the U.S. to allow us to do this. They wouldn't allow us to do it. Um, but there are, are studies that show good results, and there are show, studies that show no results. So we really don't know where we are with shockwave therapy. It's not harmful, and there's no, there's no downside to it. But is, is it effective? Well, this is a, this is a study that, that was published in 2008. They showed that, that, they, that it could not be recommended because the results showed decreased pain, but no change in deformity overall. Contrast that with this study. Uh, uh, in 2009 from European Urology looked at 100 men and they actually did show some improvement in, in uh, it, they put 2,000 shocks to the plaque, followed the patients up for 12 and 24 weeks and showed statistically significant decreases in pain, curvature and erectile dysfunction. So the main thing is erectile dysfunction. Why did the, why did the, why did the pain decrease? Well, it's pain self-limiting with Peyronie's disease. It's going to get better anyway and, and so I'll, I will move on with one more thing and then we'll quit. So basically the scratch technique was, was um, described in, in the Journal of Urology a, a year ago to, to, to Im improve curvature with penile prosthesis implantation and basically cutting the plaque from the inside at the time of penile prosthesis implantation and it was shown to, to improve the, the, the curvature uh, post-modeling in, in, in those individuals that, that had significant curvature, even calcified plaques for, uh, for treatment of Peyronie's disease with, with uh, penile prosthesis. So with that, I will stop, and thank you very much.